So, hello everyone. In the 20th century, in the past century, humankind has really managed to do the impossible and reign in famine, plague, and war. Uh, today, for the first time in history, starvation kills fewer people than obesity. Plagues kill fewer people than old age. And violence kills fewer people than accidents. And it's good to remember these amazing achievements as we look forward towards the new impossible challenges of the 21st century. And the 21st century will be full of new and even more difficult challenges than we have ever encountered before, ranging from climate change to the rise of disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence. In this talk, I want to focus on what is perhaps the most complicated challenge of all, which is the challenge to our humanity. In the coming decades, the twin revolutions of biotechnology and information technology, or really the merger of biotech and infotech into a single overwhelming scientific tsunami, this might very well undermine our conception of humanity and will shake the humanist foundations of modern civilization. Because when we come to confront any big challenge, whether it's nuclear war or climate change or AI, we always need some ethical basis to stand on. And for generations, our most solid ethical basis has been humanism. But in the 21st century, humanism itself might become obsolete. Now, what exactly is humanism? To put it very simply, humanism is the idea, the belief, that human feelings are the ultimate source of authority. When we confront any big question or dilemma in our personal lives or in our collective life as a society, humanism expects the feelings and free choices of human being to provide us with an answer. Humanism tells us to listen to ourselves, to follow our heart, to be true to ourselves. And since no one can understand my feelings and free choices better than me, no one should have absolute authority over me, over my life. This is the basic idea of humanism. Now this sounds a bit fuzzy and abstract and complicated, so I'll give a few examples of what humanism means in practice, because I think when we talk about such big questions, especially ethical questions, clarity is of utmost importance. If you don't have clarity, it becomes very difficult to really understand what we are talking about. So what is humanism in practice? Let's look at several different fields. Let's look first at politics. What is humanist politics? Humanist politics believes that the voter knows best, and governments should serve the voter. If you encounter any big political question, you should ask the voters what they feel about it. The feelings of the voters are the highest political authority. And mind you that in referendums and elections, people are not really being asked what do you think, they are asked, what do you feel? If elections were about human rationality, there was no reason to give everybody equal voting rights, because different people have different rational faculties, rational capabilities. But in feelings, supposedly, everybody are equal. And that's why, for example, when Britain needed to decide whether to leave the European Union, they didn't go to the Queen of England to make the decision. They didn't ask the Archbishop of Canterbury to make the decision. They didn't even ask the great professors of Oxford and Cambridge to make the decision. No, they went to each and every British citizen and asked him or her, how do you feel about it? And when the citizens said they felt like leaving the EU, there was no higher authority that could tell them your feelings are wrong. That's humanist politics. 
The voter knows best. Now, what is humanist economics? Humanist economics says that the customer is always right, and businesses serve the customer. How do you know if a product is good or bad? It depends on the customers. It's very, very simple. A good product is a product customers buy. A bad product is a product customers don't buy. It's as simple as that. If you make a product and you're convinced it's the best thing in the world, but nobody buys it, it means it's a bad product. You can't come to the customers and say your feelings, your choices are wrong, at least if you believe in humanist economics. Now, how does this manifest itself in art and aesthetics? What is humanist aesthetics? Just as humanist economics believe that the customer is always right, humanist aesthetics believe that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Throughout history, there are many attempts to define or to find some objective definitions for art and for beauty. But then came humanism and says, no, there are no objective definitions. There are only subjective experiences and subjective feelings. In 1917, a century ago, Marcel Duchamp took an ordinary mass-produced urinal, which I think you can see there, there, declared it a great work of art, placed it in an, in an art exhibition, and ever since then, there is this raging debate, is it art? Is it beautiful? Who decides what is art? And if you are a humanist, you will eventually conclude that, well, this depends on how people feel. Art is anything that people believe is art. And beauty is anything that people find beautiful. If somebody feels that this is a beautiful work of art, and is willing to pay millions of dollars to have it. So who is there in the universe that can tell this person you are wrong? It's not art. It's not beautiful. So this is humanist aesthetics. Now, what is humanist ethics? Humanist ethics, in essence, believes that if it feels good, do it. Again, throughout history, there are many attempts to define some absolute and objective morality, which is independent of human beliefs and feelings and experiences, based perhaps instead on divine revelation. Thus, in the Middle Ages, homosexuality was considered a terrible sin because the Bible said so, because the church said so, because the Pope said so. Then came humanism and said that we don't care about what the church says, or the Pope says, or the Bible says, we care about human feelings. This is the ultimate groundwork for morality. If two men love each other, and their love doesn't harm anybody, why should anybody think that this is bad, that this is evil? Of course, sometimes there are dilemmas, even in humanist ethics. What happens if the same thing makes me feel good? and makes somebody else feel bad, let's say I steal your car, I feel very good about it, but you feel very bad about it. So in that case, we don't apply to some higher absolute morality. We have to weigh the feelings one against the other. This is how debates, moral debate in a humanist society happen. We weigh the different feelings one against the other, and we usually conclude that theft or murder are wrong not because some book said so, but because they hurt people. They make people feel miserable. That's why they are wrong. And finally, in our brief survey of what humanism is, what is humanist education? Humanist education teaches people to think for themselves. And in past generations, in past eras, like in the Middle Ages, the main aim of education was to teach people what the wise books or the wise men of the past thought, what the Bible said, what Aristotle said, because this was the main source of authority. But when humanism rose, the, the purpose of education changed. 
Humanism says that authority comes from within yourself, not from outside. And therefore, the main aim of education, at least in humanist societies, changed. And if you go to a teacher from kindergarten to university, and you ask, what are you trying to teach your students? So the teacher would say, I try to teach history, or chemistry, or physics, but above all, I try to teach them to think for themselves, because this is the ultimate source of authority. So this is humanism. And it has dominated our world for quite some time now. But in the early 21st century, humanism is facing an enormous challenge, not from dictators or demagogues, but above all, from the laboratories. Humanism, again, says that authority comes from our feelings, which reflect our free will, which nobody besides us can really understand. But science now tells us, with greater and greater force and authority, that this is all a myth. This simply isn't true. There is no free will. It's a myth. Feelings don't reflect free will. Feelings are biochemical algorithms. And given enough data and enough computing power, an external system can understand me much better than I understand myself. The big idea of our era, whether we like it or not, the big idea of our era is that organisms are algorithms, and algorithms can hack organisms, including Homo sapiens. It's just another organism. Again, organisms are algorithms, and algorithms can hack organisms. Now, this is even more complicated than, than humanism. So again, let us try to, to, to explain and give a few examples. What, what, what do the scientists mean when they say this? Well, first of all, no free will. So the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, they understand the world better and better, far from perfect, but still better and better. And as far as they know, in the universe, there are only two kinds of processes. There are deterministic processes, and there are random processes. And randomness isn't freedom. That's very, very clear. There are, we are not familiar with anything in the universe which can be described as a free process. Free will, as far as we understand today, is an empty concept that doesn't describe anything in reality or in nature. Humans certainly have desires. They have a will. But they are not free to choose their desires, to choose their will. And their feelings, therefore, don't reflect any kind of free choice or free will. And certainly their feelings, according to the life sciences, are not some spiritual quality that God gave only homo sapiens in order to appreciate beauty and in order to make moral judgments. No, all animals, all mammals, all birds have feelings. And these feelings evolved by natural selection as biochemical algorithms for making decisions. They are, they are based not on free intuitions, but actually on calculating probabilities. The big debate about the heart versus the brain, emotions versus logic, actually there is no debate. Emotions, feelings, sensations, they are all actually also calculation, which happens so fast that we just don't notice the calculation which is happening in a split second below our level of awareness. Let's look at a concrete example. A baboon stands in the African savanna and sees a tree with bananas on it. But not far from the tree, there is also a lion. And now the baboon needs to make a decision, a decision of the kind that every animal needs to make every day of its life. Do I risk my life for the bananas or not? And the survival of the baboon depends on this decision. 
And in order to make this decision, the baboon really needs to calculate probabilities. What is the probability that if I don't eat these bananas, I will die from hunger, versus the probability that if I try to get these bananas, the lion will eat me? To survive, the baboon needs to make a good calculation of probabilities. Now, how does, in order to, to, to make the, the calculation, the baboon needs a lot of information. Information about the bananas, how many bananas, two or eight, are they big or small, green or ripe, information about the lion, how far is the lion, how big is the lion, is the lion asleep or awake, does he look hungry or satiated, and also the baboon needs a lot of information about himself, how hungry I am, how fast I can run, and so forth. And you need to take all this information together, collect it, analyze it, weigh the probabilities, and reach a decision. How does a baboon do it? The baboon doesn't take out a pen and a calculator and a piece of paper and start calculating. No, the entire body of the baboon, and especially the sensory organs and the nervous system and the brain, this is the calculator. Within a split second, the baboon takes in smells and sounds and sights and sensations from the, within the body, and the billions of neurons in the brain process the information in a split second. The calculation is made, and the answer will come not as a number, but as a feeling, an emotion, fear or courage, or perhaps indecis indecisiveness, con confusion, Fear and courage are the way that the calculation is manifested. And they are not spiritual insights. They are a biochemical calculation. And this is true of how baboons make decisions about bananas. This is true of how British citizens make decisions about Brexit. And this is true about how German citizens make decisions about immigration. What's happening there is the very quick biochemical algorithm making a calculation. There is no free will or spiritual insight involved. Now, the humanism was wrong to think that feelings re reflect free will. Until today, until the early 21st century, it still made very good practical sense to believe in humanism. Even though there was nothing magical about our feelings, they were still the best method in the universe to make decisions, and no outside system could understand what's happening within me and how and why I make these decisions. Nobody had the biological knowledge necessary, and nobody had the computing power necessary to make sense of what is really happening within me and why I feel the ways that I feel. Even if, say, the Stasi followed you around 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, all the time looking and, and watching and eavesdropping on your conversations. Still, the Stasi did not have, in the 1960s or in the 1980s, the necessary biological knowledge of what's happening inside the brain of a human being. And the Stasi did not have the computing power necessary to make sense even of the information that it did manage to gather over you. And therefore, it couldn't really understand you. But now, the merger of infotech and biotech is changing the situation. Advances in biology and especially in brain science are giving us some of us at least, the necessary biological understanding, and at the same time, advances in computer science, especially in machine learning and AI, are giving us, or some of us, the necessary computing power. And when you put the two together, when infotech and biotech merge, what you get is the ability to hack human beings. There is a lot of talk of hacking these days, about hacking computers and smartphones and email accounts and bank accounts. But 
we are really living or entering the era of hacking human beings. And once you can hack human beings, then authority is likely to shift from human feelings, which are no longer this black box that nobody understands. The authority might shift from human feelings to computer algorithms. And humanisms and, 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 and elections and, and uh, uh, the free market and so forth, all this will make no more sense. We see it happening already today, beginning to happen, first in the field of economics. We are living behind the era of the customer is always right and entering the new economic era of the algorithm is always right. Because the algorithm can predict and manipulate the feelings of the customer. Let's start with a very simple example from the book industry. How do I choose which book I, the consumer, the customer of, of the book industry, how do I choose which book to buy? So in the past, in the humanist era, I rely primarily on my own feelings and literary taste. But now, I increasingly rely on an algorithm that at least allegedly knows me better than I know myself. As I enter the virtual Amazon bookstore, the first thing that happens is an algorithm pops up and tells me, I know you. I know you based on your previous likes and dislikes and what you bought and, and, and so forth. And based on everything I know about you, and millions of other readers, I recommend this or that new book to you. Now, of course, it's still very, very primitive, and the Amazon algorithm makes a lot of mistakes because it doesn't really know me so well. It, it doesn't have enough data. But it constantly gathers more and more data and is improving. And it gathers data in new ways. If you read a book on an electronic device like Amazon Kindle, the Kindle can read you while you are reading it. For the first time in history, books read people more than people read books, with far greater attentiveness anyway. As you read a book on Kindle, Kindle can know which pages you read fast, which pages you read slow, and, which page, and when you stop reading. And this gives the algorithm a much better idea of what you like and what you don't like. But it is still very primitive. The next stage, which is technically feasible even today, you can connect Kindle to face recognition software, and then the algorithm will know what makes you laugh, what makes you cry, what makes you bored, what makes you angry. The ultimate step is to connect Kindle to biometric sensors on or inside your body, and then the algorithm will know the exact emotional impact of every sentence you read. You read a sentence, and the algorithm knows what happens to your heartbeat, to your blood pressure, to your adrenaline level, to your brain activity. By the time you finish the book, let's say you read Tolstoy's War and Peace, a very long book. By the time you finish War and Peace, you forgot most of it. But the algorithm will never forget anything. By the time you finish this thousand page book, the algorithm knows exactly who you are, what is your personality type, and how to press your emotional buttons. And using this kind of information, it cannot just choose books for you with far greater accuracy than you can. It can also tell you what to study, and where to live, and whom to marry. And people are likely, it's an empirical question. If you learn that it gives you good answers, you increasingly rely on it until you lose the ability to make decisions yourself. We see it already happening with things like navigating space, that people have learned that it's good to listen to the smartphone, to Google Maps, if they need to get from here to the bus station, to the train station, just listen to Google. And after they, they do it for a while, they lose the ability to navigate space by themselves. And even more dramatically, um, one of the most important abilities of human beings is to look for information, to look for answers to questions that bother them. 
But more and more, many people know of just one way to look for answers to questions, just ask Google. Within a very short time of, say, 15, 20 years, this crucial ability has been outsourced from the human mind to the algorithm, and there is no reason to think that if the algorithm is good enough, it will not happen in the same way with the ability to choose what to study, or whom to date, or whom to marry. Now, an algorithm can hack humans, they will be able not just to decide things for them, but also to replace them. And in the coming decades, the twin revolutions in infotech and biotech are likely to disrupt the job market and might lead to the creation of an enormous new useless class. A class of people who are useless, not from the viewpoint of their mother or children, nobody is ever useless from the viewpoint of his loved ones, but useless from the viewpoint of the economic system. There is nothing they can do better than an algorithm, than a computer, than a robot. And it should be emphasized, this is not the result just of the rise of artificial intelligence. By itself, artificial intelligence is not able to, to do something so, so, so dramatic. It's the merger of infotech, of AI, with biotech. Because for many jobs, in order to perform the job well, you need to decipher human feelings and human emotions. Computers and robots will never be able to replace human doctors and teachers and lawyers and even drivers unless they are able, at least to some extent, to identify human emotions correctly. And some people have this maybe wishful thinking that this is something computers will never be able to do. They can make calculations, but they can't understand emotions. They can't understand feelings. So they will never replace human doctors or teachers. Now, this makes sense if you believe that feelings are some mysterious, supernatural phenomena that God gave only Homo sapiens and, and that works in some metaphysical way. But if you accept that feelings are just a biochemical pattern, which in the end is a process of calculation, there is absolutely no reason to be so sure that AI will not surpass human beings, even in emotional intelligence. It will not have feelings of its own, it will not have consciousness, but it will be able to know that this person is now fearful or this person is now angry with far greater accuracy than any human doctor or teacher or lawyer. Now, just as the authority of the algorithms might come to replace the customer and the worker in the economic sphere, they might also come to replace the authority of the voter in the political sphere. Democracy is ultimately based, as we said earlier, not on human rationality, but rather on human feelings. In elections, voters are not really asked, what do you think? They are asked, how do you feel? And if algorithms can hack human feelings and manipulate and, and, and uh, predict human feelings, then democracy is likely to become an emotional puppet show. Politicians, or at least some politicians, are a bit like musicians. And the instrument they play on is the human emotional system. A politician gives a speech, and there is a wave of fear all over the country. A politician tweets, and there is an explosion of hatred. And this fear and hatred, this is the fuel of a lot of political systems. What will happen? when these musicians have a much more sophisticated instrument to play on. What might happen is the rise of digital dictatorships. In the 20th century, democracy defeated dictatorship because democracy was better at processing data and making decisions. We tend to think about the conflict 
between democracy and dictatorship as a conflict between different ethical systems. But it was also a conflict between different methods for processing data. Democracy works as a distributed data, data processing system. Democracy distributes the information and the power to make decisions between many institutions and organizations and individuals. Dictatorship, on the other hand, is a method for processing data in a centralized way. Democ uh, dictatorship concentrates all the information and all the power in one place. Now, given 20th century technology, it was simply inefficient to try and concentrate too much information and too much power in one place. It didn't work well. Nobody was able to process the information fast enough and make good decisions. And this is one of the main reasons why, for example, the Western Bloc defeated the Communist Bloc in the Cold War. There is a story that in the last days of communism, in the late 80, 1980s, a Soviet official came to London to try and understand in the capital of Margaret Thatcher, how does a free society and a free market actually function? And the British hosts, they took this Soviet official on a tour of London to visit the banks and the stock exchange and to meet all kinds of economics professors and, and, and other luminaries. But after a few hours, the Soviet official exclaimed, wait a minute, there is something I don't understand. Back in Moscow, our best minds are working on the problem of how to provide bread to Moscow. And nevertheless, in almost every bakery and grocery store, there is such a long queue for bread. Here in London, a city of millions, we have been going back and forth across the city for hours, and I haven't seen a single bread queue. So please cancel all my other visits and appointments and just take me to meet the person who is in charge of providing bread to London. I must understand his secret. And the British hosts, they scratched their heads and they looked embarrassed and they said, there is nobody. Nobody is in charge of providing bread to London. That's the secret of a free society and a free market. Nobody is in charge. You just allow the information to flow freely between all the different parts and to, you allow individuals and organizations to make their own decisions. But it is not a law of nature that under all circumstances, centralized data processing always is less efficient than distributed data processing. This was the case in the late 20th century. But now, the revolution in infotech, especially machine learning and AI, may swing the pendulum in the opposite direction. Machine learning and AI might make it possible to process enormous amounts of information centrally. And actually, the more information you gather in one database, the better the process, the better the data processing. And then the main handicap of authoritarian regimes in the 20th century, their attempt to concentrate all information in one place, it could become their main advantage in the 21st century. And this could result in the rise of a completely new kind of regime, very different from the dictatorships of the 20th century, a new kind of digital dictatorship. Finally, when algorithms can hack organisms, they could also start creating and redesigning new kinds of organisms, new kinds of living entities, it's quite likely that the main products of the 21st century economy will not be textiles and vehicles and weapons. They will be bodies and brains and minds. We are learning how to produce and engineer and manufacture them. We are learning how to design and create new organic beings by spinning up natural selection in a way. 
We are learning how to create cyborgs, which are beings that combine organic with inorganic parts. And finally, we are even learning how to create completely inorganic beings. And if this indeed happens, this will be not just the greatest revolution in history, since history began about 100,000 years ago, it will be the greatest revolution in biology since the very beginning of life, four billion years ago. For four billion years, nothing fundamental changed in the basic rules of the game of life. Many things happened. The dinosaurs appeared, the dinosaurs disappeared, the mammals appeared, all kinds of things. But the basic rules didn't change. All beings for four billion years, whether amoebas or dinosaurs or tomatoes or homo sapiens, were subject to the laws of natural selection and were subject to the laws of organic biochemistry, made of organic stuff. Now, in the 21st century, natural selection might be replaced by intelligent design as the basic driving force of the evolution of life. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design. And even more so, the intelligent design of our clouds, the Google Cloud, the Microsoft Cloud, they will be the main driving force of evolution. And at the same time, after four billion years of being stuck in the small puddle of organic biochemistry, life might break out into the vastness of the inorganic realm. So who will decide what to do with these godlike powers of creations, of creation? Will the voters decide? Will the customers decide? Will we just listen to ourselves and follow our heart? But how do you follow your heart when your heart is constantly being monitored and manipulated by an algorithm? That's the big question of our time. Thank you. So thank you, Yuval, for this grand history and this grand image of how we have uh, to look forward for uh, some challenges within the 21st century. And as far as we have running out of time, uh, at the very beginning of our conference, uh, I just would like to invite one person to raise a question. And I asked Sheila Jezanov, who unfortunately have to leave us immediately after her talk that she w could have the opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, Sheila Jezano from Harvard. So, Sheila, it's for you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and uh, it's uh, obviously a daunting task to <laughs> follow what you've just said with any questions whatsoever. I'm tempted to ask about 50 different questions, beginning with the fact that you're useless class slide was highly gendered and it made me think that perhaps there's hope because there weren't too many women <laughs> in the useless class. But, uh, but visuals, visuals aside, um, you know, ethics, which is what we're celebrating today, has taken root in spaces of doubt, ambivalence, disagreement, not knowing ways forward. Your talk is was extremely uh, the opposite of that. I mean, that is, it's, uh, um, your talk was, um, uh, I'm trying to bring up something, and my machine is misbehaving, showing perhaps <laughs> uh, that um, um, well, I may have to look for it again. Um, 
I don't know why this is happening. Um, I may not be able to give you the exact quote, but your point about demagogues playing publics like musical instruments. Mm -hmm. It brought to my mind a passage which some people in this audience may be familiar with. It's out of Hamlet. I wanted to quote the exact words, but my iPhone is not bringing up the, the, the exact quote at this moment. But you recall he has a conversation with Guildenstern in which he hands Guildenstern a flute mm -hmm. and says, play this flute for me. And Guildenstern keeps saying, my lord, I can't. I mean, you know, I don't have the skill. I can't uh, play on the keys, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Hamlet says, "Look, you. Do you think that I am easier to be played with than mm. a flute, which you do not have the technicality, the technical procedures to deal with? Uh, your algorithmic future that you're outlining uh, not only has mastered the flute, but has mastered the human. And I just wonder where in your, you know, space of deterministic futurism." against which there is a lot of evidence as well, you have room for the kind of uh, challenge mm. that Hamlet was posing uh, to Guildenstern, who was presuming to know algorithm-like what would make this very ambivalent prince tick. So what would you say? How would you rewrite hmm. that passage in Shakespeare? I wish I could read it for you because I would love you to produce the piece of counter Shakespeare for us mm -hmm. in the moment. Well, it's a very, very good and timely question. I'll, I'll try to, to answer a few aspects of it because it's a very complex issue. First of all, in order for this kind of scenario to be realized, the algorithm doesn't need to play the flute or the, or the person perfectly. It just needs to do it better than the average human. In order for us to trust Google Maps to navigate the city, Google Maps doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be better than the average human. In order for self-driving cars to replace human drivers, they just need to drive better than the average human. They don't need to drive perfectly. That's an impossible, that's a two, uh, nobody can do that, of course. But better than humans is not such a, 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 an impossible mission. Today, for example, human drivers kill about 1.25 million people every year, mainly due to human error. So to improve on that is not an impossible mission. And similarly, for uh, algorithms to play a greater and greater role in making very important economic and political decisions, they don't need to be perfect, they just need to be better than the average human, which is, again, not as impossible as uh, sometimes we tend to imagine. And I don't say that this is a good future or a good development. We have to be extremely careful about the terrible dangers it involves. But to be really aware of the dangers, we need to be more humble about our own abilities as human beings uh, compared to the computers, compared to the algorithms. If we fortify ourselves inside this kind of imaginary fortress that, oh, we have things the algorithm will never be able to understand. We have free will, we have the spirit, we have the soul. They will never understand that we are safe then it will be extremely easy to dupe us and delude us. The easiest people to manipulate, for example, with fake news, is people who trust too much in their own free will and, and say, oh, I'm not making this decision because of anything. It, it's just my free decision. They are the easiest people to manipulate because they can't even conceive how easy it is to once you get to know their weaknesses, once you get to know their hatreds or their fears, it's so easy to manipulate them. Unless, of course, they have a much better understanding of themselves and of their weaknesses and of their imperfections. I think that when we come to confront this big danger of, of, of the algorithmic future, a more realistic and humble appreciation of human uh, ignorance of human stupidity, of human weakness is, is key. I, uh, my main fear is not in the end from artificial intelligence, it's from natural stupidity. I think it's a far greater danger because this is the opening that artificial intelligence uh, 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 can go through. Now, I definitely don't think 
the, I don't believe in, in technological determinism that, okay, AI is coming and there is nothing we can do. There is just a single outcome this can result in some creepy dystopian future. No. No technology is ever deterministic. We always, we don't have free will, but we do have will, we do have choice, we do have some power left. And we know from history that the same technologies can be used in very different ways. If you look at that East Germany and West Germany, they had access to exactly the same technology. They had electricity, they had radio, they had cars, they had trains, they just chose to do different things with them. It's the same with AI and biotechnology. They will change the world, but they can change the world in different ways. And it's still up to us to try and influence the direction it is taking. And I think that, as I said, a, a more humble and realistic appreciation of human abilities and human limit, limits uh, will make it more, um, more, not certain, but will make it more hopeful that we can make the right choices. Thank you.